Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessings of the Sabbath. Thank you for taking us through the week and Lord, all through uh, the activities we have undergone. And uh, I pray that in this Sabbath uh, you may uh, clean thou us and make us whole and seal us for thy courts above in heaven, Lord, as thy people celebrate this Sabbath as they gather to rejoice in uh, Christ forgiving their sins and creating a new heart in them. May I be among those who will have a testimony that, Lord, you have delivered me from uh, this world. And so thank you for the children. Help us as we go through uh, the last of this presentation in Revelation chapter 14. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to say thank you so much uh, for God giving me this chance and uh, uh, enabling me to go through the book of Revelation chapter 14, the three angels messages. This is the number 10 in the 10 part series on uh, uh, Revelation chapter 14, the three angels messages. And uh, uh, we, we just wrap up with uh, seeing some of the things maybe we touched here and there and they make or could have not been understood better and so this is a, a summary of the other uh, uh, in fact 10 presentations that we have had uh, and we are just putting it in a, a summary and I hope you'll be blessed and so the three angels messages are uh, the last messages to the world this is uh, what Christ says in Matthew chapter 24 and the gospel of this kingdom shall be preached and then the end shall come and so this is the gospel that has to be preached and ripen uh, the harvest in fact we are told in revelation chapter 14 that uh, the angel is seen saying that go and reap the earth because the harvest is ripe and so these are the messages that has to ripen the world and bring in the harvest and so the message essentially is uh, uh, Revelation 6, uh, 14, 6 to 12, but it doesn't just end there. It goes to the end because at the end you find the, the gathering into the Ghana, those who are ripe for heaven, and the gathering into Bana, those who are going to be thrown out. And so we read, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth, and the sea, and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead on his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints, here are they that uh, keep the commandments of God, and the faith of Jesus Christ. So much is made about uh, keeping the commandments, but uh, uh, the antinomianism that is against uh, commandment keeping, actually, I don't know how you can read this, that here is the patient of uh, the saints here, they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ, if the commandments are of no real importance. So in what we have seen so far, uh, number one is the sum and the substance of the message is total submission to Jesus Christ that leads to honoring all of his commandments. The investigative judgment began in 1844. True worship versus false worship is the marquee issues in these messages. True worship is honoring God's commandment. False worship is honoring man-made traditions. There is more. B, C, the commandment that reveals God as the creator sanctifies the seventh day or Sabbath. 
the tradition of the beast is the Sunday tradition which represents rebellion doing things our way against God and uh, we can go back the other two presentation and see if any man worship the beast in fact three presentation if any man worship the beast the the beast his image and his mark and then the seal of God this goes these three presentations goes deeply into these issues of the mark uh, the image and uh, the seal number four maintaining solid hell keeps our minds clear to discern God's voice and truth and to detect and resist lies uh, and evil and we saw that in uh, giving God glory and worshiping him how we have to uh, keep this sanctuary built according to the pattern that was shown Moses in the mountain and not build it according to our own pattern finally in uh, number five we saw Babylon Falls around 1844 but this is a posted Protestant is uh, churches that rejected the Sabbath and held on to her traditions and so we find that this church of Rome had fallen long time ago and in 1844 it was the apostate churches that became Babylon and uh, the message was not given in a loud voice uh, because the churches had not reached the state of Revelation chapter 18 and so when this message is repeated under the fourth angel's message which is the loud cry attended by the latter rain, the additional mention of the sins of this church and all these churches, whether whichever day they are worshipping will be mentioned and uh, the people will be called out of them. Number six, the beast is the papacy. Her image is the fallen apostate protestant churches. Her mark is Sunday keeping. This is a rebellion against God. The result of rejecting God's truth will be receiving the wrath of God. And so two-thirds of the messages are politically incorrect if you look at them, but we don't have to be politically correct. We need a people who can stand for the truth even though the earth and the heavens fail. And illegal and hate speech. It is coming a time when you have to quote the Bible, you will have to be jailed, you will have to be persecuted, you will have to be hated by your own members, even your family members. And in Mexico, AR, this act prohibits any group from speaking ill of any religious group. Uh, this makes it legally impossible to preach the second and third angels' messages about Babylon is fallen. The SDA church called to proclaim these messages, signed this document, and now longer preaches these messages in Mexico. The Lord is raising up stones now to proclaim the truth. The context, Revelation 14, 4, 14 to 19, And I looked and beheld a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee, for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. This is the ripening of the saints, because the preceding verses talks about the bloodshed, which is the harvesting of the, e the, the evil. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was ripped. And another angel, this is the gathering of the wicked, angel came out of the temple, with, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in the sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. This is the now the the the, the harvesting of the wicked. We see that um, the second coming of Jesus Christ depends more so on the ripening of the church and not of the wicked. So while we are waiting for the world to become uh, more evil, what the Lord is really waiting upon is his people to send their sins into the sanctuary above and they be confessed and repented of. And then he will have a spotless church which he can present before his father as a pure uh, bride. So we are in the season of harvesting and the angels are uh, recording with terrible exactness about these things that are, are happening. And at the end of the day, we have to choose which side we shall be. Christ comes with a sickle to harvest the earth. The Bible is very clear what harvest is. The field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. 
The enemy that saw them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, then let him hear what the Spirit speaks to the churches. So the message that we have is that Christ is coming. The message of Revelation 14 are given to prepare people for the second coming of Christ. We saw that the reason why the three angels' messages are given, they are light, they shine with the glory of God. And amidst the darkness of this world, the people have to be called into his marvelous light. The grace that God has put upon us and his love and didn't withhold anything to humanity but gave his only begotten son so that whoever believeth may not perish but have everlasting life. The last message to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. The children of God must um, exhibit, might, might, must show what the grace has done in their life in good works. That is Christ oblique, lesson page 415, paragraph 5. By how we respond to these messages will determine our destiny, whether to be saved in Christ's kingdom or to be lost. These are the messages for this hour. The entire world hangs in the balances and are weighed up against these testing truths for this time. So, the messages of destiny before 1844, white horse message of the righteousness of Christ, red horse of the warning fallen into sin, black horse warning, final warning, pale horse wrath of God. And since 1844, we have had the first angel's message is Christ, righteousness in the judgment, Sabbath, second angel's message of warning fallen into sin, and the third angel's message, final warning. And then we have the result of rejecting these messages, the wrath of God is a sin. What do you expect then? Revelation 14 has given us three messages. By how people respond determines their destiny. Revelation 15 should give us some idea about the destiny of the saved and the lost. We should hear something about the righteous and their destiny and the destiny of the wicked. What will be the reward of accepting the three angels' messages? What will be the punishment of rejecting them? Revelation uh, 15 talks about uh, this balance in the sanctuary and then the 144 who has the father's four, uh, name on their forehead are united in a perfect square. Revelation 14 has given us three messages by uh, how people respond determines their destiny. And then uh, we see this balance in the sanctuary, weighed and found one. So we read in Revelation 15, 1, 8. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw at, as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Amen. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works lord god almighty just and true are thy ways thou king of saints who shall not fear thee O lord and glorify thy name for thou only art holy for all nations shall come and worship before thee for thy judgments are made manifest and after that i looked and behold the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened again and the seven angels came out of the temple having the seven last plagues clothed in pure and white linen and having their breast guarded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who liveth, uh, uh, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues, plagues of the seven angels were filled. And so, uh, the 144, they are victors, and the wicked are losers. The victors are 144 that sing the song of Moses and Christ, and they sang a, it's, it to a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the 140 and 4,000 which were redeemed from the earth. 
Revelation 14, 3. And so, the losers, those who reject the three angels' messages will receive the of the seven last plagues. Then Jesus will step out from between the Father and man, and God will keep silent no longer, but pour out his wrath on those who have rejected his truth. The nations are now getting angry, but when our high priest has finished his work in the sanctuary, he will stand up, put on the garments of virgins, and then the seven last plagues will follow or will be poured out. I saw that the four angels will hold the four winds until Jesus was work was done in the sanctuary, and then will come the seven last plagues, the plagues and rage the wicked against the righteous Maranatha 258. Friends, Jesus Christ is coming. He's about to seize his intercession in the heavenly sanctuary. He won't wait for everyone any longer. When Christ seizes his intercession in the sanctuary, the unmingled wrath written against those who worship the beast and the image and receive his mark in Revelation 14, 9 and 10 will be poured out. The plagues upon Egypt when God was about to deliver Israel were similar in character to those more terrible and extensive judgments which are to fall upon the world just before the final deliverance of God's people says the revelator in describing those terrific scourges. There fell a noisome and grievous saw upon the men which held the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. The sea became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. And the rivers and fountains of waters became blood. Terrible as these inflictions are, God just stands fully vindicated. The angel of God declares, Thou art righteous, O Lord, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of the saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. By condemning the people of God to death, they have as truly incurred the guilt of their blood as if it had been shed by their hands. In the plague that follows, power is given to the sun to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat. Verses 8 and 9 of Revelation 16. The book of Maranatha 267 continues to say these plagues are not universal or the inhabitants of the earth will be wholly cut off. Yet they will be the most awful scourges that have ever been known to mortals. All the judgments upon men prior to the close of probation have been mingled with mercy. The pleading blood of Christ has shielded the sinner from receiving the full measure of his guilt. But in the final judgment, wrath is poured out and mixed with mercy. The bolts of God's wrath are soon to fall, and when he shall begin to punish the transgressors, there will be no period of respite until the end. The storm of God's wrath is gathering, and those only withstand who are sanctified through the truth in the love of God. They shall be hid with Christ in God till the desolation shall be overpassed. Amen. Solemn events before us are yet to transpire. Trumpet after trumpet is to be sounded, vial after vial poured out one after another upon the inhabitants of the earth. Selected Messages, Book 3, uh, 426. In testimonies to ministers and gospel workers, 182, the world is soon to be left by the angel of mass and the seven last plagues are to be poured out. The bolts of God's wrath are soon to fall and when he shall begin to punish the transgressors, there will be no period of respite until the end. For mighty angels hold back the powers of this earth, 7 BC 967, till the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads. The nations of the world are preparing for conflict, but they are held in check by the angels. When this restraining power is removed, there will come a time of trouble and anguish. Deadly instruments of warfare will be invented. Vessels with their living cargo will be entombed in the great deep. All who have not the spirit of truth will unite under the leadership of satanic agencies, but they are to be kept under control till the time shall come for the great battle of Armageddon. Uh, so the spirit lets us know, angels are now are restraining the winds of strife that they may not blow until the world shall be warned of its coming doom. But a storm is gathering ready to burst upon the earth, and when God shall bid his angels loose the winds, there will be such a scene of strife as no pain can picture education 179 108 the savior's prophecy concerning the visitation of judgment upon jerusalem is to have another fulfillment of which that terrible desolation was but a faint shadow 
in the fate of the chosen city, we may behold the doom of a world that has rejected God's mercy and trampled upon his law. Great Condor, verse 36. Satan will then plunge the inhabitants of the earth into one great final trouble. As the angels of God cease to hold in check the fierce winds of human passion, all the elements of strife will be let loose, the whole world will be involved in ruin, more terrible than that which came upon Jerusalem of old. It is the glory of God to be merciful, full of forbearance, kindness, goodness, and truth. But the justice shown in punishing the sinner is as verily the glory of, of the Lord as is the manifestation of his mercy. The Lord of God of Israel is to execute judgment upon the gods of this world as upon the gods of Egypt. With fire and flood, plagues and earthquakes, he will spoil the whole land. Then his redeemed people will exalt his name and make it glorious in the earth. Shall not those who are living in the last remnant of this earth history become intelligent in regards to God's lessons? Manuscript Release, Volume 10, 240 to 241. And so, the events that we are seeing happening in this world have been predicted in the book of Matthew chapter 24, Luke chapter 19, and Luke chapter 21. And uh, brothers and sisters, there's still nothing to hold on to but to cling to Christ, to wear that robe of righteousness that has been provided freely for us. For this is our only safeguard against what is coming in this world. And having the Spirit of Christ in us will help us endure what is coming, even when there is an agitation against us, we shall remain calm as Jesus Christ remained calm when he was being taken to Golgotha to be uh, crucified. The plagues of God are already falling upon the earth as we speak, sweeping away the most costly structures as if by a breath of fire from heaven. Will not this judgment bring professing Christian to their senses? God permits them to come that the world may take heed, that sinners may be afraid and tremble before him. I expect that during the year 1890, there will be great mortality. There will be crimes greater than any now on record. There will be weeping and lamentation and woe. During the past year, 1889, there have been brought to us almost daily the news of disasters by sea and by land, unusually destructive fires, earthquakes, burning cities and villages with their inhabitants. Railway accidents most terrible tornadoes and floods that destroy an immense amount of property, including the terrible Johnston and Williamsport floods, which destroyed more than 2,000 lives. Now, talking about 1890 and the two years prior to that, that is 1888-1889, the Lord sent the most precious message to the church, the message of righteousness by faith through Elders Wagoner and A.T. Jones. But the people did not heed it, and we are told that uh, in two years, the world could have been warned ere long the Christ could have come and taken his church. Uh, during that time, there were Sunday laws. Uh, I have uh, looked at them uh, in the previous presentations on this series of three angels messages where Seventh-day Adventists were arrested and imprisoned and fined uh, because Sunday was prohibited. Uh, worship on any other day than uh, Sunday had been prohibited. But uh, when the Lord looked at the church, it was not ready. And uh, 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 the Lord, who is so long-suffering and merciful, uh, delayed his coming. And Peter tells us that uh, the delay works for our own good, so that uh, the Lord does not delight in anyone to perish, but all may come to repentance and be saved. So the prophet talking about the disasters that were happening from 1888 to 1890, he says, he says, the disasters of the past year in America have caused hearts to tremble and similar disasters have fallen upon other countries. Already sprinklings from the vials of God's wrath have been let fall upon land and sea, affecting the elements of the air. The causes of these unusual conditions are being searched for, but in vain. And uh, the things that were happening in those years, we see them again starting to happen currently. I'll, I, I can go from video to video and picture from picture to show you what is happening around the world, but you already know what is happening around the world. Suffice what we are reading. And so the plagues and the trumpets are kind of similar in their, uh, in their falling. In Revelation 8, 7 falls on the earth, the vials in 16 to 
uh, force on the earth. And uh, you can say that the trumpets are an eavesdropping of the real event of the seven last plagues. So we know that the trumpets are warnings to prepare people for what is soon to come. And so uh, this is just a, a small miniature of the bigger picture that is coming in the seven last plagues. As we see these things happening, the things that should be happening under the seven last plagues, we know that the Lord is speaking to us. We know that the Lord is trying to awake his church so that it may not be found sleeping when sleeping at such a time is so uh, perilous. And so you can see the parallels between the trumpets and the plagues. Uh, the plagues are showing us that uh, the Lord uh, has to warn the world of um, the impeding uh, judgment that are soon to happen. And so uh, I won't go through these similarities. You can check them, uh, the similarities between the trumpets and the seven last plagues. And the trumpets we know are uh, God's warning. And uh, uh, again, we are uh, being uh, warned in uh, signs of the time, January 25, 1910, paragraph 16. In the issue of the contest, all Christendom will be divided into two great classes, those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus and those who worship the beast and his image and receive his mark. Although church and state will unite their power to compel all both small and great, rich and poor, free and born to receive the mark of the beast, yet the true people of God will not receive it. The prophet of Patmos behold them that have gotten the victory over the beast, over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God and singing the song of Moses, the servant of God and the song of the Lamb. The third angel's message increases in importance as we near the close of this earth history. It is the last offer of mercy to the world, the most solemn message ever given to mortals. In heaven there is a record kept of the impatience of nations, of families, of individuals. And you can go and watch uh, the number eight in the presentation of the three angels' messages by Brother Zadok where he goes uh, uh, in details about the third angel's message and it is uh, consequences. God may bear long while the account goes on. Calls to repentance and offers of pardon may be given. Yet a time will come when the account will be full, when the soul's decision will have been made, when by his own choice man's destiny will have been fixed. Then the signal will be given for judgment to be executed. The forbearing that God has exercised toward the wicked has emboldened men in transgression, but their punishment will be none the less certain and terrible for being long delayed. And so, because the Lord does not act, because judgment is delayed, the, the, the hearts of men work strong in sin. Uh, the Lord shall rise up in, in us in uh, <coughs> Mount uh, Perazim, he shall be wrath, uh, wrath as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, uh, the book of Isaiah. Uh, the act of punishment is a strange work, it's a strange act to the Lord, because when you read the book of Isaiah, the Lord, what he wishes is to send the watchmen to the people and the watchmen to give a message, and then the evil and the wicked ones turn to him. But... Um, Although God delays in these things, instead of taking this opportunity, uh, the wicked will uh, still continues to grow strong in their evil. Yet he will by no means clear the guilt, the Lord says. By terrible things in righteousness, he will vindicate the authority of his downtrodden law. The very fact of his reluctance to execute justice testifies to the enormity of the sins that call forth his judgment and to the severity of the retribution awaiting the transgressor. And so in Ezekiel 33 verses 11 and the story of the Amalekite in Deuteronomy chapter 25 and uh, uh, the issue of Perazim and Gibeon in Isaiah 28, 21 we read, the Amalekite had been the first to make war upon Israel in the wilderness and for his, this sin Together with their defiance of God and their debasing adultery, the Lord through Moses had pronounced sentence upon them. By divine direction, the history of their cruelty toward Israel had been recorded with the command 
thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, thou shalt not forget it. Deuteronomy 25:19. For 400 years the execution of this sentence had been deferred, but the Amalekite had not turned from their sins. The Lord knew that these wicked people would, if it were possible, blot out his people and his worship from the earth. Now the time had come for the sentence so long delayed to be executed. The forbearance that God had exercised toward the wicked emboldens men in transgression, but their punishment will be none the less certain and terrible for being long delayed. The Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perazim, he shall be wrath as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act, Isaiah 28, 21. To our merciful God, the act of punishment is a strange act. As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but the wicked turn from his way and live. The blood of Jesus Christ is crying for everyone that hear it. And he says that if you hear the voice of the Lord, do not harden your heart as it were the Jewish in the wilderness when they tempted the Lord and uh, has conned his offers of mercy and even tried to retreat back to Egypt by saying that make us a leader that we may go back to Egypt. They worshipped uh, uh, the calf when Moses was receiving the commandments and when they were bid to go straight to Canaan they were of doubtful heart and uh, sent the spies something that uh, God had not intended them to do. And so the journey that could have taken 11 days from Kadesh Barnea to the promised land now has to take 40 years in the wilderness. And then uh, those younger ones who had not rebelled are the ones that ended. But those who had uh, been 20 years and above and uh, uh, grieved the Holy Spirit of God did not enter into the canon. And even the servant of God, Moses himself, who was made to sin by the people and Aaron the high priest, they did not enter. And God have mass upon us that we can be leaders and at the end of the day not enter into the promised land. Uh, the, the, the beautiful thing is that Moses uh, and uh, Aaron confessed their sins and uh, the righteous hope to meet them and uh, share with them a moment in eternity. The Lord is merciful as we end in gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, yet he will by no means clear the guilty. Exodus 34 verses 6 and 7. While he does not delight in the vengeance, he will execute judgment upon the transgressors of his law. He is forced to do this to preserve the inhabitants of the earth from utter depravity and ruin. In order to save some, he must cut off those who have become hardened in sin. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. Nahum 1.3 By terrible things in righteousness, he will vindicate the authority of his downtrodden law. And the very fact of his reluctance to execute justice Testify to the enormity of the sin that called forth his judgments and to the severity of the retribution awaiting the transgress. But while conflicting, inflicting judgment, God remembered mercy. The Amalekites were to be destroyed, but the Canaanites who dwelt among them were spared. These people, though not wholly free from idolatry, were worshippers of God and were friendly to Israel. Of this tribe was the brother-in-law of Moses, Hobab, who had accompanied the Israelites in their travels through the wilderness and by his knowledge of the country had rendered them valuable assistance may the good lord be with us may he continue directing us and at the end of this race may we say that uh, this is the lord whom we have waited upon and he has come to save us god bless us shall we pray thank you heavenly father and so thank you for the series of uh, Revelation chapter 14, the three angels' messages. Father in heaven, I pray that even those who have not had chance to listen and watch firsthand, when they get to this material, they will be blessed, Lord. May you help us to continue drawing closer to thee and renounce self. Father, in ourselves, we can do nothing that is acceptable before thee. And so lay the glory of man in dust, that the glory of Jesus Christ may be revealed in thy people. Seal us for thy courts above and give us the 
strength to go and preach these messages in love, in uh, patience, and Lord, in kindness. Above all, prepare us for the second coming of thy Son. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen.